Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us to this uh, wonderful CBE uh, discussion and class series. At this time, I would like to call upon CBE Director Reverend Jerry Hirano for opening guest show and to introduce today's guest lecturer. Thank you, Koichi. Okay, thank you, everyone. Could you please join me in guest show? Today, it's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Mark Blum. He is an integral part of many of our various programs in the live CBE at JSC. So we're happy that he was able to speak to us on Honen this morning. Let me tell you a little bit about his biography. Um, Dr. Mark Blum is a professor in Shinjo Ito, Distinguished Chair in Japanese Studies at UC Berkeley. He received his MA in Japanese Literature from UCLA and his PhD in Buddhist Studies in 1990 from UC Berkeley. He specializes in Pure Land Buddhism throughout East Asia with a focus on the Japanese medieval period. He also works in the area of Japanese Buddhist responses to modernism, Buddhist conceptions of death in China and Japan, historical consciousness and Buddhist thought, and the impact of Nirvana Sutra in East Asian Buddhism. He is the author of many works such as The Origins and Development of Pure Land Buddhism, co-editor of Renyo and the Roots of Modern Japanese Buddhism, Cultivating Spirituality, and his amazing translation from Chinese of the Nirvana Sutra, Volume 1. And he's currently working on completing Think Buddha, Say Buddha. So Dr. Blum, thank you for speaking to us. If you could now turn over the time to you. Thank you very much, Reverend Hirano. I appreciate the kind introduction. It's good to see everybody, although I can't see you, but I know you're there. And um, um, let me just say that um, the book that Jerry just mentioned, uh, Think Buddha, Say Buddha, is a book about the history of Nembutsu. So, um, one of the things that drew, has brought me to the conception of that book, which is quite complicated, and I and, it's, and I worry if I'll ever be able to finish it, but I certainly intend to, uh, is um, the impact of Honen upon Nembutsu. And so what we generally do not see in the study of Buddhism or the study of religion as a whole, but we see a little bit in the study of Christianity is the study of a practice and how a practice takes on a kind of life of its own. And that is something that happened with Nambutsu. And the person who I think really crystallized this uh, and in doing so led to a lot of innovative responses to Nambutsu is Honen himself. So Honen is kind of an enigmatic figure and I confess that I'm gonna give you my own personal view uh, my own personal interpretation of what um, where uh, what his insight, what his ideas, where they came from, how he conceived of them, and why he was such a prominent figure historically. Um, and you guys are certainly free to uh, question uh, anything that I say today. I'm very happy to to discuss um, both, you know, your our understanding of Honen and of and Honen's ideas, and of course, the impact they had on Shinran. I'm not going to talk about Shinran today um, because we normally do that, but, um, but you know, he'll be mentioned a little bit, of course. Uh, but the, the, the focus is to try to get a deeper understanding of Shinran's teacher, Honen, who not a whole lot has been written about in English. A huge amount has been written about in Japanese. Uh, and, you know, I can, I can tell you that, um, but let me let me let me get to my slide. Let me get to the first slide anyway, so this will look better. Just a second. Japanese historians have written many many books concerning Honen, um, and you see a whole lot more writing about people who do history, economic history, political history, social history. They write about Honen. They don't write about Shinran very much uh, because Shinran was not well known at the time. Shinran doesn't leave much of a historical footprint in the capital, uh, Shinran's legacy is in his influence uh, and, the, and the movement that he started, which then grew and grew and grew. 
uh, to become, of course, uh, dominant in, in, in the area of Japanese religion. Uh, but Honen was somebody who was actually quite well known at the time. And Honen was, has such a big impact on his environment from the very top of the uh, upper classes to the very bottom of the bottom classes. Uh, he's really kind of unprecedented in that way. And, and it's very interesting that actually a lot of other Buddhist writers at the time, like Jian, for example, who is the, um, you know, the abbot of Mount Hie and Yakuji, you know, in his Gukan show mentions Honen. Honen's mentioned in all sorts of other collections by other people. Um, his name comes up, normally it's Genku, not Honen is the name that, that is more commonly used. But so he was someone that you sort of couldn't avoid. And, um, and of course, by inference, we can see the way his, his approach to Buddhism, his ideas very much influenced others that came after him, even people who were not involved in Pure Land Buddhism. Okay, so let's start. Um, so this is a um, blown up picture of, um, from Honen biography scroll. Um, and I think what, nothing about Honen that's really striking is the number of biographies written about him is really stunning. There's so many biographies written about Honen within a hundred years of his death. But the whole studies, there are whole books in Japanese just devoted to the study of these biographies trying to sort out um, you know, the common material and differing material. There's at least eight or nine biographies that I've looked at myself. Um, it's really astonishing. And um, here's a good, here's a scene from a very famous uh, pictorial biography. Um, and what is striking here, of course, is that you see the people sitting in the room around him um, some are well-dressed, some are less well-dressed, and you just have people outside coming to hear. It's like an event that Honan is speaking. Um, there's a lot of women, uh, and um, these picture scroll biographies have people from all walks of life. You know, another striking thing about the, the pictorial representation of this period is we see a lot of people who are kind of outcasts in these pictures as well. Uh, it's really very eclectic and very democratic. And that's, I think, a big part of, uh, of the kind of revolutionary transformation that, that, that went on in the Kamakura period. Okay, all right, so point one. Shinran did not replace Honen. So this is simply about the fact that um, because Shin Buddhism is so big today and works like the Tani show, have such a strong appeal even among people who are not Shin followers, the Chinese Tani Shou being probably the most well-read book on religion in the post-war period, even the 20th century and 21st century as a whole. It's very easy to lose sight of Honen. Honen is not um, talked about so much. Certainly in the West, we have almost nothing. There's only one uh, book written on Honen. It was done 30 years ago. It was not very well done. Uh, and so we, it's very easy to, um, unless you're reading Japanese materials and you're reading Japanese history and you're reading people who work in the history of Buddhist thought, you just don't come across him. Um, however, from a historical perspective, <coughs> excuse me, Honen's impact was really unprecedented and it still resonates heavily uh, today. So I'm gonna try to recreate that powerful scenario of Honen, Honen's life uh, what was happening in the capital of Kyoto, what he was, what he wrought, and of course, what his legacy has meant for Buddhism in Japan and Buddhism in the world as a whole. That is Buddhism, period. Okay, whoa, all right. Oops. Okay. Um, list of accomplishments. So this is also kind of astonishing if you look at this list. He's the first person to have written an essay on Buddhism written in Chinese that was actually printed in Japan. Um, you know, Honen's essays are, Honen's writings are printed before the Gutenberg Bible, okay? So uh, Honen, uh, the uh, printing did occur in Japan. It was very expensive uh, and it only occurred because people either had strong donors behind them or they, uh, or in addition to that, of course, they also felt they were gonna have an audience for it, but there's no real printing industry as such. Printing is not a business in the 13th century. Uh, that doesn't really happen until we get to the 17th century. 
Um, so this is really kind of a, uh, you know, you might say a labor of love, but also a kind of religious activity that creates merit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so he's the first person that I know of to have written an essay in Chinese. That's a Sen Chakshu uh, that's printed. He's also, as far as I know, the first person who to have his Japanese language essays uh, printed. Uh, and that's what's called the Wago Toroku. That's a, a sort of collection of his Japanese language writings. Um, and in fact, you know, in that regard, it's worth saying that Honen maybe, I mean, I can't say this for sure, but it appears that Honen maybe, in fact, was the first person to write in Japanese uh, on Buddhist themes in a way that circulated. You know, you know the, the relationship between the Chinese language and the Japanese language in Japanese Buddhist history is quite complex. Uh, so even though, for example, the Japanese writing system is invented around 800, we don't really see writings on Buddhism in Japanese until we get to the, to the 12th century. And Honen, uh, we have collections of stories, Setsuwa stories, but in terms of a, of a kind of you know, critical essays about how to understand Buddhist teachings, how to engage in practice, uh, what Buddhist faith means, how it's, uh, how it's achieved, et cetera. I think Honen is probably the first person to, to do this. And this kind of opens the door for other people to start writing and publishing in Japanese. In a way, that's one of the radical changes that happened in this time is suddenly it's okay to write in Japanese. <clears throat> on Buddhism, you know, the Chinese language is a language of scripture. And so of course it has a certain authority, but Dogen does most of his writing in Japanese. Nichiren writes in both languages, Shinran of course in both languages. So, um, and it's one thing again, to write in Japanese, another to actually have blocks carved and printing done of those writings. So that's also quite astonishing. Uh, anyway, um, Honen is a, number three, the first to, or create or found a new Buddhist sect in Japan without face-to-face -face transmission from a master in China. So if you, if you think about what you know of Buddhist history in Japan, all the, the six schools of Buddhism in the Nara period all result from direct transmission coming from China. We come to the Heian period, we have the Tendai school, Saicho goes to China. We have the Shingon school, Kukai goes to China. These are all, they bring back, you know, this kind of, not only uh, textual materials, but they bring back an understanding that they learn from these recognized masters in China. And that gives them an imprimatur that the court recognizes, and that allows their new religious organization to receive government recognition and to be established. You know, getting recognition of a new sect uh, in medieval, in ancient Japan is not an easy thing. It's a political decision. Uh, Saicho, as you probably know, had some difficulty getting approved from the court, but he does, he gets his own ordination ceremony, his ordination platform, etc. <clears throat> and so anyway, so we get to the, if you think about the new schools of Kamakura Buddhism, you know, like Dogen, Eisai, they go to China to learn, to bring back the tr transmission of Zen. Honen and Eisai live around the same time, they're born within a couple of years of each other, uh, Honen does not go to China, and yet he's able to create a new school. So that's quite, uh, quite remarkable. Number four, Honen uh, is the first to, urge, to explicitly urge a religious paradigm that is his vision of what, uh, of what Pure Land Buddhism is and should be, which is based on an existential rather than an idealistic approach to Buddhism. And by this, I mean that Honen Tonen's religious paradigm is striking at the time because until Honen, everything in Buddhism was about the ideal of attaining nirvana, becoming a Buddha, um, and, and the pure land or rebirth in the pure land or rebirth in heaven, for example, were just intermediate goals. Uh, but the idealism, the ideal, idealistic goal of attaining nirvana remain, remained the dominant form. When you get to Honen, suddenly the focus is not so much on this ideal, but on a, but turning instead the camera back toward yourself and talking about, well, who am I? 
And am I really going to become a Buddha? Do I really have that potential? And and recognizing that you do not, <laughs> you know, Shandao is is sort of speaks of this, uh, but Honan really instantiates this at the center of his whole religious message, uh, and that is so. You know, he it 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 raises the question: Well, what is what what does Buddhism mean to us if we're not going to become Buddhas? If we're not going to Nirvana? If we can't attain this? Then what 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 is Buddhism, and how does it function, and what can we expect from it? And how can it help us? So that's really kind of a radical move. And I think that's also one of the reasons that Honen engendered so much resentment and, um, and, and political trouble. Okay. Okay, number five. Honen is the first person to define a form of practice as a sacred object. Uh, and of course, I'm speaking of Nembutsu here. Uh, and to talk about one's relationship to, the, to that practice. In other words, to recognize that the practice itself is sacred and to develop a kind of personal relationship, not with the Buddha, not, you know, Honan doesn't talk to Amida like, you know, evangelical Christians talk to God or talk to Jesus. Honan's relationship is with Nembutsu and the Nembutsu represents the Buddha and he doesn't talk to Nembutsu, but, you know, he reveres it, he carries it with him, it's sort of on his sleeve all the time, it's in his mouth all the time. And so this is a, also kind of a new approach in which um, the, the, the focus of one's religious practice is not something distant. It's the Nembutsu, which is right here, which I can create by uttering Namo Amina Utsu. So how, how, can the, how can such a simple thing achieve such, such power? This is one of the enigmas of this story of this history and I would submit to you that it attained great power precisely because of the personality of people like Honen and Shinran, who people saw that in fact, this was alive in them, this was actually happening. So Honen is the first person, certainly in Japan, to do this. Uh, and I think that Shandao probably did it in China as well. Uh, Shandao's legacy in China is a little more complicated because a lot, most of his writings were lost in the massive persecution of Buddhism in 845. But Shandao's writings survived in Japan completely. And so uh, Honen had them very close to him. Anyway, so that's, that's number five. Uh, that's also quite radical, quite new, quite powerful, quite influential. Number six, um, Honen is the first monk to incur such resentment, such wrath among his competitors that it led to overt, even violent suppression of a religious movement. You don't see anything like this prior to Honen in Japanese history. Um, so there are people in the, for example, in the Nara period in the eighth century, when the government was trying to control all ordinations and you were not, and the, the national temples in the Kokobunji system were not supposed to be preaching the Dharma to outsiders, but only people inside the temple. And most people could not get access to those temples because they were government institutions serving a government function. We also have people that ordain by themselves. Uh, and they, they have a kind of private ordination ceremony, maybe with a few friends, and they live their lives as a monk or as a nun independent of this government system. That incurred the wrath of the government. But the worst thing that happened to them is they may get arrested and detained for a few hours and let go and, and told you know, fingers are waved at them and said, or wagged at them and said, you're not supposed to do this, you know, you have to get government permission, et cetera, et cetera. That's the extent of it. But the oppression of Honen and his movement was violent. Uh, and the history of Honganji is testament to that. As you know, Honganji has burned down more than once. Uh, when Honen's first, uh, the printing of Honen Senchakshu first happens, um, monks from the Tendai school find out where the printing was done. They come into the buildings, uh, they take the wood blocks out and they destroy them. So there was all sorts of things that happen. People are exiled, um, books are burned, you know, Honen's grave is desecrated, by the way. Uh, it's a, these, these things never happened before. So this doesn't happen to somebody, <laughs> you know, who, who was not noticed. Honen was noticed, okay? So in that sense, you know, like we don't, you know, Shinran's death, of course, is a very important part of the history of Shinshu, but we don't 
his grave is not desecrated. You know, we don't, he doesn't incur that kind of reaction from people. He doesn't have that kind of public profile that Honen did. So for Honen, you know, Honen's battle was much more uphill and he encountered much more open public resistance uh, to the point of, you know, being a little bit dangerous even. I don't think there was any danger to him personally, but anyway. Okay, so, so let's do a little mini history of um, the, what Honan kind of stepped into so you can get a sense of what was happening before him. Um, I have to say, you know, that one of the things about studying Honan is, is a lot of his, a lot of what he talks about is sort of there already before him. Um, so we have to be honest and critical about that. So what, what was around, you know, how much Pure Line Buddhism is there in Japan? How much Nembutsu is there in Japan prior to Honen? Honen may be the first person who created a Nembutsu school, a sect, a denomination of Pure Land Buddhism, but obviously he's not the first person to think or write or practice or believe in Pure Land Buddhism. Um, so Nembutsu itself, Nimfo in Chinese, this means just put aside your understanding of Nembutsu as you as you know it or practice it. The word Nimfo is, is far, far earlier than this. And it me it you know goes back to Sanskrit, Buddha Anusmurti or Buddha Smurti. And uh it's just uh and the, the nen means mindfulness. So it's mindfulness of the Buddha. Uh now Buddha mindfulness can take lots of different forms, and, and Nembutsu Nimfo is not necessarily an oral recitation. Uh, in fact, in the earlier forms of it, it's, it's a silent meditation. Uh, it involves visualization. It involves focus on the meaning of a Buddha. It involves focusing on the form of a Buddha. In a way, you know, all these things are expedient means to get you to focus better. And it's through that mindfulness, right, that you achieve a kind of meditative state that advances your spiritual sensitivity and ultimately, ideally, will lead to samadhi, right? uh, in which you then have real spiritual insights and spiritual attainments, even to the point of being able to see the Buddha or see the Pure Land. This is all described in the scriptures, uh, in a number of scriptures. And this kind of thing is uh, was widely practiced uh, in India, in China, uh, in Tibet, in, you know, all, in the entire Buddhist world. Um, Although, you know, I don't, I don't know so much of this in Theravadan Buddhism, but it certainly pervades Mahayana extensively. So, um, so the Pure Land, there is a kind of a Pure Land movement uh, as such focused on uh, the three Pure Land Sutras, focused on um, the power of recitation that starts in the sixth century. And, uh, you know, Tanluan Dondan is the first sort of uh, recognized patriarch, even though there were practices going on before him. Uh, we don't have much writing about it. So the nearest person that wrote about it, who was studied later as Tanduan, this is in the sixth century. It's very interesting that Bodhidharma, the founder of the Zen school in China, Chan, and Tanluan, the founder of Qingtu or the Pure Land School, both were active in the Liang dynasty in southern China. In the first half of the sixth century, both had personal meetings with the Liang dynasty emperor, Liang Wudi. Um, and Liang Wudi himself is a fascinating figure, probably, maybe arguably the most devout Buddhist king in Chinese history. Uh, he himself gave lectures on sutras, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he was a very strong promoter of Buddhism. And I, you know, he's someone to take note of because when Buddhism was first brought to Japan, remember it was brought from the Pekche state in Southern Korea, Southwest Korea. Pekche Buddhism was essentially learned from Liang Wudi, from the Liang dynasty. That's the Buddhism that they got because this is also, this, look at the time period. This is the same time, you know, the, uh, the transmission of Buddhism to Japan supposedly happens in 552. Uh, this is the Buddhism that was, uh, again, brought, uh, studied, and borrowed temples erected, scriptures read, practices done in Korea based on what they saw in the Liang dynasty. The Liang dynasty king uh, provided them with all sorts of assistance. Uh, and that's precisely the Buddhism that came to Japan. So in fact, you know, we have a kind of, um, you know, history of 
of Buddhism that starts in Japan, that's really the Buddhism of this particular form that's happening in China in the first half of the sixth century. And that's a fascinating history. And by the way, Nirvana Sutra, Nirvana Sutra is very, very prominent in the Yang Dynasty Buddhism as well. And I think that's why it had a big impact um, in Japan also. Okay, so the next piece of the history uh, is that Daochou and Shandao, Daochou of course is Shandao's teacher, it's sort of like Honen and Shinran, uh, they kind of uh, formulate together a conception of Pure Land Buddhism as a separate path. Uh, and that's, that's essentially seventh century early Tang Dynasty. At the same time, the Platform Sutra in Chan is being created, you know, it's the same, they're, they're, these are two parallel movements in Chinese Buddhism that reflect a kind of new synthesis of Indian Buddhist traditions uh, in the Chinese mind and the Chinese cultural context that made sense. And that's why these are the two forms of Buddhism in China that ended up having the longest, longest lasting impact even up to the present day. So um, one of the things of course that Daocho and, and Shandao both uh, emphasize or praise or focus on or valorize is recitation, nembutsu, recitation, niamfo, and, and why? Because they're, they're trying to create a model that they see as working. They're trying to convince people that, in fact, recitation, niamfo can work uh, just as effectively as silent meditative niamfo. And and so this, you know, in terms of uh, philosophical history, the high point of this is Shandao's commentary on the Contemplation Sutra, where he goes through every practice, every line in that text in enormous detail. With the, um, and when you get down to the nine grades of people uh, and what kinds of practices are appropriate for them, uh, that's when, in fact, Shandao uh, gets to the mentioned for the first time of reciting um, the nyam for, for the ninth people, for the ninth grade of people at the bottom as being the practice that is in fact what the Buddha really was trying to say to everybody. So that's the big shift. Um, so in Japan, um, we see already evidence in the earliest Buddhist temples in Japan of the cult to Amida, Amitabha and Horyuji. Uh, we see it in the paintings in Horyuji and sculptures. We have Pure Land uh, exegesis in the Nara period in the 8th century. Uh, when we get to the Heian period in the 9th century, we have uh, Tendai uh, sect using images of Amida in their main halls. We have uh, Endin, uh, who after Saichu is you know, sort of next major figure in the history of Tendai bringing this this five melody Nimbutsu recitation form from China. Uh, and he goes to China to study, of course, he's there during that 845 uh, unfortunate time. And, but this is very important because from ending, we have now a kind of Amida centered uh, practices going on on Mount Hiei. Um, and you know, by, certainly by the end, uh, by the um, eighth century, by we get to say 850, um, Tendai is emerging as the dominant form of Buddhism in Japan. So here's something that's a little bit unusual for probably most of you. You may not, I don't know if you, how much you know about this, particularly uh, the best show part, but let me talk about something else uh, that's part of my research uh, that's not well known in the West. And that is Nimbutsu Hijiri and something called Besho and Sanjo. So um, Nimbutsu Hijiri, uh, these are kind of itinerant preachers uh, the most famous or perhaps the first one is this person named Kuya, uh, who did not leave any writings. So we don't really know what his own personal thoughts were, but there was there's a lot written about him. He was quite a famous person. He was also kind of a charismatic preacher, uh, probably self-ordained. Some people think his family was actually kind of, um, maybe he had an illegitimate bloodline from the imperial family. We don't know about him except that uh, he showed up on the street corners of Kyoto in the capital uh, reciting Nimbusu and urging people to chant with him. And it's very much a kind of uh, recitation Nimbusu performance um, that he himself embodied 
Uh, and the fact that he's moving around all the time gives him a kind of special appeal to a lot of people. Um, so Kuya is known, and you know, here's a picture, uh, a statue of Kuya. Uh, that there's a there's a there are a few of these were, were created uh, in the Kamakura period, uh, and they all sh show um, this little wire coming out of his mouth was Buddha standing on top, which is how the sculptors tried to indicate that he's reciting the Nembutsu. Okay. So this is the this is the recitation of the Buddha coming out of his mouth, right? And you can see he's got a, a gong around his neck that he bangs to, to create rhythm to support uh, his recitation. So this tells us that this is not merely a kind of ritual droning, but this is musical, okay? That there's a rhythm to it. And you've seen the pictures probably of Ipen and his dancing Nembutsu group. Uh, which are depicted in, in picture scrolls from the 13th century. Um, and they have a similar kind of gong to, or something, a bell that they hold in their hand that they bang like this uh, also to keep time, okay? So that's the kind of, you know, you might say musical side to this. And the other thing is something called Besho and Sanjo. Um, and this is not, I don't think anyone's written about this in English yet. Um, there's not a whole lot written about it in Japanese either, but uh, it's very intriguing to me. And I want to talk a little bit about this today. Uh, and you're certainly free to ask questions if you like. So what are Besho and Sanjo? These are, um, so these are Japanese words. I apologize for people who don't know Japanese. And, but uh, Besho is literally a separate place. Sanjo is kind of irregular or unsettled place, unsettled place of work, for example. These are places where people gathered uh, who, to, to, who were working in the service industry, essentially. Uh, and in Japan, in China, you have something called corvée labor, which is a kind of national tax that everybody's obligated to uh, pay. And you don't pay the tax in money, you pay the tax in work. So everybody has to spend a certain amount of time working for the state uh, as kind of a national duty, just like uh, income tax would be. Uh, and so sometimes this one could negotiate to perform your corvée labor for a Buddhist temple or for uh, a, an aristocrat working in the government, for example. And so these Sanjo were places where those people gathered to do that kind of work. Uh, and a Besho could be like that too. Beshos typically belong to temples, but not exclusively so. So the point is that these are physical locations that are outside the kind of mainstream focus of political, cultural, economic activity. And the people who are in these places are all working class people who do not have a uh, status in society. Um, so Hijiri themselves would be their artists. Um, for example, actors, um, this is true in Europe. This is certainly true uh, in Japan. That if you're an actor in the medieval period, you have very low status. Uh, and uh, this is not something uh, someone from a good family wants their ch children to engage in. Um, and actors, of course, they had their, the income they had is very unstable, difficult, uh, various kinds of artisans also. So these are places where these people gathered. Okay, uh, there's not much historical information about them precisely because they're off the beaten track because they're outside uh, what we know. But in these places, uh, Honen goes to these places and I think Honen sees kind of Nembutsu activity happening. My guess is that he sees kind of artistic Nembutsu happening in those places. All right. So, so before I, I'm going to go back to the, the, that topic in a second, but let's first talk about the other kind of intellectual um, predecessors of Honen that kind of influenced his worldview. Uh, two people in particular stand out here, Genshin and Eikon uh, or Yokan. Um, so Genshin is very famous. Uh, this Genshin lives at the time when the Tale of Genji is written. In fact, there's a there's a, a Buddhist monk in the Tale of Genji that people believe represents Genshin. So there's no no doubt that the author of the Tale of Genji knew about Genshin, whether or not she'd actually met him. Uh, Genshin is up on Mount Hiei, which of course is right next to the capital of Kyoto. Uh, he has enormous celebrity status. Uh, among the aristocracy. 
Uh, but Genshin, it's, uh, at one point, decides that as he becomes more and more famous, he gets more and more involved in the politics of the monastery. You know, the, it's a big monastery. There's 3,000 people living there, and many of them come from the court culture. And so Genshin decides he's not going to continue to further his career. He's going to quit, and he leaves. So he does a kind of second renunciation. You know, you, you sort of renounce the world when you become a monk. Genshin does a second renunciation in which then he leaves Mount Hiei, the main temple in Ryakuji, and goes off to a more remote place in the mountains to focus on his practice. So he becomes more religiously committed, more remote from the world, uh, because he needs that in order to uh, focus on what he, he's pursuing. And he writes, of course, this Ojo Yoshu, The Essentials of Birth in the Pure Land. Uh, now, that book has not been translated yet. Robert Rhodes is working on it. So most of you probably don't know what's in it, but uh, it's half of the book is about Nimbutsu. And it, uh, there's a lot of interesting discussion of you know the use of Nimbutsu in different scriptures and Genshin's discussion of the visualization meditation exercises in the contemplation sutra and how they relate, how they are essentially a form of Nembutsu. What? Why? Because they're a form of mindfulness of the Buddha, right? Uh, you know, Buddha mindfulness, as I call it. So the other person is Akon. Akon is also probably much less well-known even than Genshin. Uh, and it's funny that we don't even know how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Only in Japan would you have the name of a, of a person whose pronunciation of the characters are unclear, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it could be Akon, it could be Yokan, and uh, some scholars insist it's Yokan. Uh, but in any case, um, he's a Sanron monk. That's an old Nara school. And um, he leads, he writes a couple of essays. And the interesting thing about him is that he identifies himself as being of the Nembutsu school, the Nembutsu Shu. So that doesn't mean that there was a Nembutsu religious organization a pure land religious uh, sect or organization called the Nembutsu school. This, this use of Shu refers to a kind of, um, you might say, religious focus or doctrinal focus, or even a lineage of study and practice. And so what Akon is saying is that I'm a person whose religious orientation is Nembutsu, right? And look at his date. So he's, he's a, um, you know, 11th century, uh, this shows that, you know, in the end of the Heian period, there's a lot of people focusing on Nembutsu, writing essays about it, right? Um, and Akon uh, also appreciates Shandao's emphasis on recitation, uh, Buddha mindfulness. And here is an interesting image from the temple uh, called Akon Do, which was a Shingon temple originally in Kyoto. And uh, Akon um, saw that it wasn't really very active and he moved there and asked permission to sort of take it over. And again, he himself had celebrity status. He had high ties to the aristocracy. And so they let him do that. And he turned that temple into a Nembutsu dojo uh, where people came for intense Nembutsu practices. And even today, they have an overnight Nembutsu practice ritual that they do. Uh, that I was invited to, but unfortunately didn't attend. And, um, and this is a famous image from that uh, temple, where it's called the Mikairi Amida, where the Amida Buddha is not looking forward, he's looking over his shoulder. And this is sort of unprecedented. Um, and the image probably dates from 12th century, they're thinking, so right after Akon. Uh, and so it kind of reflects Akon's kind of eclectic uh, eclectic Nembutsu approach. Uh, but what you're seeing is the, you know, what this means, you know, is interpreted in different ways by different people. And of course, there's all sorts of stories about, you know, the Buddha uh, looking over his shoulder because someone is sort of being left behind or something like that. Anyway, uh, so I invite you all to go to Kyoto and go see this statue. It will be very moving, I promise you. Okay. So two more pre honen figures, uh, just to go through them quickly, but they're also part of the story. Kakuban uh, is the most famous Shingon priest after Kukai. Uh, he's probably the only really Shingon priest after Kukai in the Heian period that really had any impact. 
And uh, he was also into Nembutsu. He writes, uh, he has an essay called the Amida Hishaku, where he gives various forms of Nembutsu. He kind of splits the, the word, the phrase Namu, Amida Butsu, and has puts other words in between Namu and Amida in there. Very interesting, very creative approach, uh, very esoteric. Uh, not well known, not well practiced, but nonetheless, it shows that he's part of Nembutsu culture. Uh, and he's very, very prominent. Kakuban led a kind of reformation movement within the Shingon school that got him into trouble. He was exiled within his own school. He creates a separate branch of it. So, you know, this is, he's, he's kind of revolutionary in his own way, but very, also very influential and, uh, and very much responsible for the kind of resurgence of Shingon at the end of the Han period. And this shows that, in fact, Pure Land Buddhism and Nimbutsu practice was part of that movement. Um, Ryonin. Ryonin is also not well known, but Ryonin was a Tendai monk who, to me, is kind of a prototype for Honen. He dies in 1132, uh, and Honen is born in 1133, so there's no overlap. But nonetheless, uh, Ryonin sets a kind of precedent that I think Honen was clearly now aware of and uh, and moved by and probably to you know in some sense kind of followed Dionin. So Dionin uh, leaves Mount Hiei for Ohara in northern Kyoto, not on the mountain but in the valley. Uh, and this is a, this is a best show. This is a kind of external piece of land, not central to the religious organization, but something that they uh, they owned. Uh, and he creates his own dojo there, much like Akon creating a dojo in a temple in the middle of Kyoto, but this is outside the city. So today, you know, if you go up to that temple, to that area, you'll see it's all farmland. Uh, so it's not, uh, again, this is not a place that you would normally ga gather attention. You know, what's impressive about these people, uh, someone like Dionin, is that he's not, he's not creating a dojo in a place where he knows there's gonna be a lot of foot traffic, right? That people are naturally gonna to go to. You're gonna to have to get out of your, go out of your way to get in a carriage or get on a horse or, you know, to get up to his temple if you're gonna go participate and see what's going on. Nonetheless, it's not up on the mountaintop. So it's not that remote, but nonetheless, it's still kind of outside. You might say it's sort of like suburban, except that there's no real town out there, right? Um, so this is part of the appeal of these kind of other locations um, called Besho. Anyway, um, Leonin also is a devoted Nembutsu practitioner. He has his own notion of Nembutsu called Yuzu Nembutsu uh, and that uh, was centered on group chanting uh, that he believed that the when you chant with other people, the, you know, everybody's participation multiplies everybody else's participation. The merit is that much greater. The impact is that much greater. Uh, and this is quite is interesting. There's no question that he also had some kind of performance activity happening in his in his temple. Dornin, you know, was pretty successful for being sort of a nobody uh, and being in this, this kind of odd place, this ge geographical place. But I, you know, but not only is he a prototype for Honen, but he shows that in fact, um, you, if you create something great, people will come, you know? And so it also, again, I think this shows the power of Nembutsu prior to Honen. So Nembutsu is in the culture. Nembutsu is being used by people in very creative ways uh, before Honen, okay? Along comes Honen himself. Okay, so now we come to Honen himself. Um, he's born in Okayama area into a samurai family. Uh, depending on which biography you look at, Honen's father is assassinated when Honen is a, a young, is uh, adolescent. Uh, in one biography, uh, he's actually assassinated inside the house when Honen is there and he's only nine years old. So clearly lo losing his father at a young age, very traumatic for him. Uh, his family puts him into uh, the Tendai Monastery. So he enters Mount Hiei as a novice at the age of 13. So similar to Shinran, Honen essentially grows up his adolescence, his young adulthood is as a Buddhist monk on Mount Hiei. Mm -hmm. Now, after 28 years of diligent and successful work, uh, Honen has a kind of 
um, you might say spiritual moment in which he decides he has to leave that environment, something he has a realization that motivates him to take the next step. Uh, just like Genshin, uh, both Honen and Genshin were prominent, were successful, were, were respected monks. Nobody doubted uh, their status. They're not, they did not give up their status as a monk. You know, Shinran decides he's gonna give up his monastic status. Honen doesn't do anything like that. Genshin doesn't do anything like that. But in contrast to Genshin, who goes further in, deep, further into the remote areas of the of the, of the, the Higashiyama mountain range, Honen comes down into the city, and Honen decides he's gonna he's not gonna be up on the mountain. He's gonna be with the people, and he you know comes and takes up residence in a Tendai temple inside Kyoto, uh, uh, just east of the river. Um, so. That year is 1175, and um, although Honen himself didn't, you know, because I've read a lot of Honen things, I, I, there's no indication that Honen himself created a, a sect of Buddhism at that time, but the Jodo sect, the Pure Land sect of Buddhism regards that, that movement that year as the founding, the beginning of their, their school. Okay. So what we know and what we guess. <laughs> Being now a city dweller, Honan, of course, is free to move around and see different things. Um, and I'm quite convinced, and there was evidence that he visited at least one Besho. And I believe he visited a number of Besho and Sanjo uh, and learned from, from what he saw there. Um, I'm convinced that he's impressed. I'm going to read this by the genuine religious feeling and intense nimble to practice he saw in these places, in which laymen and women, probably including Nembutsu Hijiri, were involved. Remember, Nembutsu is already, you know, quite prominent uh, in uh, various religious Buddhist settings in Japan. Uh, and Honen is seeing a kind of religious culture uh, that's not being necessarily, you know, led by prominent educated monks, but he's seeing a Nembutsu culture that's being kind of creative, creatively, you know, generated by the people living in these out of the way places. Okay. He probably witnessed theatrical productions as well. They were both compelling and fun. So I'm now going to, um, take a linguistic time out and hope everybody, if you could indulge me for a couple of minutes, I want to talk about these words. <laughs> okay. Besho Sanjo Sangaku. Um, and don't worry if you don't know any Japanese, I'll explain it. Uh, if you do know Japanese, you'll enjoy this, I think. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. It's a little bit, you know, kind of off the beaten track. But I think this is a very important part of the story and a completely unrecognized, not completely, but largely unrecognized aspect of this history. Uh, what's a best show? Okay. So best show probably started off as something like vacant lots. These are temple land holdings that were not used by whoever owned the land, usually a large temple with extensive real estate. You know, at this time uh, in the 12th, 13th century, the kind of economic structure of how Japanese society worked had changed to the point there that we have these things called shōen. These are large estates that are owned uh, by various, you know, wealthy groups of people, either families or um, Shinto shrines or Buddhist temples. And, you know, just like in China, one way to avoid taxation was to donate your land uh, to a temple. Uh, and the temple would let you live on it. Uh, but this is also a way for the temples to become economically self-sufficient, is that they own land, uh, they have farmers that work on the land, you know, that essentially are serfs, they, they would be serfs working for a feudal lord, or they'd be serfs working for a Buddhist temple or a Shinto shrine. Um, and so it, their life was essentially the same, and the temple generates income from these properties. So in owning these properties, and, and like I say, all the major temples in Japan had properties like this. Um, there are a, a, a lot of spaces that are simply not being used. And that's what Besho are. Um, and we see the term Besho come up 
uh, when people start living there, right? When people start gathering there. And sometimes these are like daily workers that go there to get hired uh, that day. And sometimes there are places where people just gather to, for social purposes. Um, they're off the grid. And because they're off the grid, we don't know anything about them. They're not recorded. Um, and, um, but typically actors and musicians would be there and they would not be under the scrutiny of any government authority. So they're free to do what they want. Um, and we know that uh, this attracted all sorts of uh, people with kind of an open mind uh, and not only people who had artistic impulses, but also people who had religious impulses. And so um, there was various things that went on, um, certainly lectures, study groups, uh, performances, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you had a new idea and you wanted to kind of test it out, you could go to one of these best show and talk to people and see how they responded. So they become what I consider havens of counterculture. Uh, and this, the counterculture that they generated, uh, you know, produce art, music, religion, et cetera. And we see evidence of what they produced later on. But at this time, like I say, we can only guess as to what was really happening there. So that's a best show. Asanjo is something similar. Uh, so if you look at the word best show, betsu means separate. Okay. So show is just place. So kind of separated place, you know, again, uh, like, um, off the grid, something like that, another place. Uh, san show is, is a similar word. Uh, san means scattered, okay? And so here it's scattered in the sense of being kind of unstable or uh, unsettled. And also san means unpredictable. Uh, so san show are, are similar uh, places. They're, the word is used a little bit differently than best show because Sanjo uh, became places that um, people gathered who were hired as attendants, uh, low, you know, sort of working class people working for large institutions. Um, and this is again, how they paid their uh, corvée labor tax duty. Um, and um, because uh, a lot of people, because the Sanjo were specifically places that kind of that gathered workers together, the word Sanjo came to be used to represent the workers themselves. And the word Sanjo, when it refers to a worker uh, working in this kind of prof these professions, it uh, some people see it as a term of discrimination that these people were very low class. Uh, and so um, some people even equivalent, uh, say, think is an equivalent to the word hinin. Uh, and it sometimes, Perhaps the words are used interchangeably, but at this time the word hinin is not necessarily uh, meaning outcasts. It just means people who are again kind of low class and who are defined by the particular jobs that they do. And those jobs could involve, or often did involve, you know, uh, work that uh, created a, a kind of polluting effect. So I'm talking about cultural pollution, not um, you know physical pollution such as picking up dead animals and things like that, taking care of, of anything to do with death, right? Or the droppings of animals, you know. So these are cleaners, right? Um, anyway, um, we also find out again, that a lot of the people that are associated with these Sanjo areas where people called Sanjo are performers, uh, just like we see in the best show example, they're dancers, they're singers, they're called, you know, they may work as an attendant or a clean, you know, a cleaner for uh, a rich family. Well, when it comes to or a temple, when it comes to a New Year's celebration, then they're invited to come up and perform their dance. Uh, so um, the other thing is the word "san" also means something like this is my own translation, as you like it, uh, and therefore we have a term "san entertainment," uh, "sangaku" in Japanese. This is a form of theater that involved humor that originated in China that was brought to Japan sometime during the Heian period, probably the late Heian period. And Sangaku, um, that is, you know, this kind of unsettled uh, theater, it's unsettled because again, it's free, because it's unpredictable, because it's not controlled, right? This means that people could be creative in this context and not get into trouble. And Sangaku then produces Sarugaku. Sarugaku, Saru, of course, means um, 
<laughs> means monkeys, but uh, sarugaku was another form of kind of uh, somewhat improvised humorous theater that was very popular at the time, certainly at Honen and Shinran's time. Uh, and sarugaku, of course, then gives way to no theater. So sangaku, from sangaku was born sarugaku, from sarugaku was born no, and you know this is all connected to these this artistic community that's sort of on the outside of things. And uh, Zayami, for example, the most famous uh, no playwright and sort of producer, you know, creator, uh, director of no theater himself. It comes from a very low class family. His family are labeled Kawaramono. These are people that live on the riverside. They're essentially no different than Sanjo or Hinin. Sometimes people use that word Kawaramono also as a synonym for Hinin, you know, non, non fully, not fully human. And um, so um, this is also, again, as I, as I state, as I stated, this is part of this, this kind of tradition that is cultural pr productivity happening by non-professionals who are on the outside of mainstream society. And these, this is the kind of culture that I feel had a big impact on Honen. And Honen combined his sensibility from studying in Mount Hiei with what he learned from these people uh, that impressed him because there's clearly some kind of nembutsu activity happening among these groups as well. All right, enough on that. So. Here's Shan, Shan, this is a picture from a Honen biography of uh, Shandao, Honen meeting Shandao. Okay, well, this is the, oh no, this is, this is, <laughs> this is the Shandao's uh, river, I guess. Okay. Anyway, all right. So, Nembusu gifted by the Buddha. So, this is, um, now we're getting into Honen's thought. So, some people say that, uh, I guess what I saw in this picture is Shand, uh, Honen seeing Shandao in his dream. That may be what this is. Um, I think that's what this is actually. Yeah. So she, this is the only, instead of Han, Honen going to China and meeting Shandao, he has a dream in which they have a conversation. All right, so some people say that Honen had a kind of sudden enlightenment in reading Shandao, uh, but it's clear from his writings that his understanding of what Shandao was saying is quite complex and is, is not based merely on Shandao. Uh, for Honen, Buddhism's historical decline, that is the notion of Mapo, uh, though inevitable as we get further in time and space from Shakyamuni, is in fact not the, should not be the dominant, um, you might say, doctrinal theme that should guide a person's religious understanding. Uh, for Honen, that's really just an expedient means to get us to recognize the meaning of Nembutsu. In other words, from Honen's perspective, what's really happening here is all this talk of Buddhism declining over time is, um, is in fact a kind of way to bring us to this realization. And therefore what you see in the Heian period is lots of discussion of Mapo. You'll see lots of discussion of Mapo in the Kamakura period and much as well. But in fact for Honen, that becomes secondary. He doesn't talk about it very much at all. And that's why I believe that that's another one of the impacts that Honen has is a sort of the end of Mapo theology, okay? That that's no longer needed. Uh, the other, Honen's other point is that um, Nembutsu is gifted to us uh, by Shakyamuni and Amida in the sutras. Uh, and it, it functions as a tool uh, to bring us into a kind of karmic relationship with Amida and his pure land. This is the message of the sutras. Dao Chu and Shan Dao make it clear, uh, try to make it clear to us that it's the recitation form of Buddha mindfulness that has this kind of unusual power uh, to focus the mind and affect spiritual change. Right. So, uh, oh, I don't have his Todaiji talks here. Okay, sorry about this. This got edited out. Um, that's strange. Excuse me. Yeah. So in 1190, Honen um, is invited to uh, Todaiji uh, and gives a series of lectures on the Pure Land Sutras. Uh, after that, 
uh, obviously he's invited to Todaiji. You know, Todaiji is of course the National Cathedral of Japan. Uh, this is a great honor. Uh, this shows that Honen is already recognized as a person who has something to say. Um, after that, he becomes even more famous uh, and his public lectures in Kyoto uh, grow, see the crowds growing larger and larger, okay? And one of the things that marks this is that Honen has become a kind of celebrity preacher and a lot of people come to hear him and there's a great mixing of male and female, you know, upper class and lower class, uh, older monks who are kind of skeptical and younger monks who are very, very eager to hear what he has to say. So it become, becomes a kind of sounding ground for, let's throw out these, you know, for a new way of thinking about Buddhism. Um, at this time, Honen is invited to the uh, palace of the prime minister, who's called the Kampaku. He's his chief minister, the person who's really running the government, right? Uh, appointed by the king, by the emperor, uh, Kujo Kanezani. Kujo Kanezani is very, very famous in literary circles because of his diary uh, that has a lot of detail about court activities and cultural activities in the capital at this time. And Honen becomes his kind of spiritual mentor. Now Kanezani invites a number of people uh, to meet with him, uh, but Honen is a person that he's really focused on. And so he asked Honen to give a series of lectures explaining his kind of theology, his doctrinal understanding uh, in detail. So Honen goes repeatedly to the palace of Kanezani and gives these lectures. And clearly there's a group of people in attendance there. And we have uh, a copy of, and those lectures become the Senchakshu. Okay? So the Senchakshu is not something that Honen sat down and wrote. It's the, uh, it's essentially these are his lecture notes from his talks at the palace of Kujo Kanizane. And we have a manuscript uh, from this time written in three different hands. That is handwriting of three different people. Uh, and of course, it's a fascinating thing is Honen is always speaking in Japanese. The Senchakshu was written in Chinese. So how people took, you know, wrote down what he said in Chinese while he's speaking in Japanese, uh, it's pretty impressive. This shows you the degree to which people were uh, able to go in and out of both languages, at least in the written form. Uh, in any case, um, um, so Honan has great, at that point, Honan has great appeal to people of all classes, including the very, very highest level of political authority in the culture. Now, um, some books have a history that make them more than a physical object. For example, like the Gutenberg Bible is, you know, is revered, et cetera, et cetera, is a national treasure. The San Chakshu, I would submit, is just such a book. Uh, we have this manuscript I just mentioned. Um, and then once that is sort of organized and put together, and by the way, that manuscript um, has all sorts of crossouts in it. I've seen it, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and you can see that people, said, no, 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 not this, it was this, you know, <laughs> they're, still, they're still in the process of editing it and creating the final edition. Um, and once it's put together, then everybody wants a copy of it. And you have to get Honen's permission to be able to copy it. Uh, and it's very interesting, Shinran is allowed to make a copy. Shinran also uses this as an opportunity to make a, a sketch of Honen himself. Uh, so, you know, there do you see the celebrity of Honen being represented by this text, right? It's a very big deal. And more and more people want copies of this. The Honen's appeal gets broader and broader. But, you know, Honen is very much afraid of this getting out into the public because the ideas are radical. And so you have to make a pledge. You have to make a promise that you're not going to show this to the public. You're not going to show this to anybody else if he allows you to make a copy. But Honen had so many disciples that a lot of people end up with copies of it. So, um, in the same way that Honen saw how the Nembutsu was a kind of lifeline bestowed to us by Amida Buddha himself, the Sen Chakushu as a book was seen by many as a lifeline bestowed by Honen himself. And they regarded Honen therefore really as a Buddha in their time. Now, here was a person of unusual clarity who had produced something that represents him, right? And we all want it. So um, 
So what do I mean by this? And this way, the Nimbutsu does not merely represent the Buddha. It is the Buddha in a perceivable form. That is, in the, uh, the Nimbutsu is the Buddha in the form of sound, okay? Uh, and the Sen has something like, has an appeal something like that. You know, according to Honen, you know, the Nimbutsu is the Buddha, right? And we can kind of create what's, what we would call a Nirmanakaya form of the Buddha by saying the, the reciting the Nimbutsu. Ipen was convinced that the Nimbutsu had agency, that it made its own decisions, that it was a Nimbutsu that, that on its own decided to come out of your mouth or not, okay? Uh, you know, Ipen is clearly reflecting Honen's view that the Nimbutsu represents the Buddha for us. The Nimbutsu, in that sense, is the Buddha. Okay. Um, so hearing or uttering a sound of the Nimbutsu, therefore, is akin to the visual experience of seeing a statue of, the, uh, of a Buddha that moves you. And of course, you have many, many stories of statues talking to people. Uh, you know, that's how this, the, what's one of the stories of the Ekando uh, Buddha, Amida looking over his shoulder is that uh, Akon is walking around <laughs> inside the temple <laughs> and carrying that, you know, the, the theory is that Akon found this statue, you know, in Todaiji, he was at Todaiji and uh, it was in a storage house and nobody was looking at it and the statue was so beautiful and so moving, Akon put it on his back, he stole it essentially and brought it to Kyoto. <laughs> And the monks are running after him, saying, "You can't do that! You can't do that!" All right. Anyway, that's another that's another deal. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> as Sen Chakchu circulated among Honen's disciples, uh, and no doubt Kanizani had a copy, uh, as I alluded to before, there was a lot of buzz about it. So, in the early 1200s, uh, Honen's fame becomes bigger and bigger, and so people uh, this produce jealousy, this produce enemies. And they all want to see that Sen Chakshu, you know, so they can use that, you know, to kind of, um, as it means to attack him. And of course, the followers of Honen want to get a copy of it so they can use it to find out what the hell he's talking about and to, and to see his convincing explanation as to why Nembuzu is so special. Um, by 1205, a petition arrives at the court from Kofukuji, which is sort of one of the dominant monasteries in Nara Kofukuji, of course, uh, is funded in uh, almost entirely by the Fujiwara family. So it's very, very wealthy. Uh, prominent monks are calling, uh, appealed, sent a petition to the court calling for legal action to stop the, stop the activities of Honen and his Nembutsu school. Um, this is Nembutsu Shu, that's a term that's used. Um, and they complain, you know, again, that his doctrine is dangerous um, and is gonna lead to political instability. It's going to lead to antinomianism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in 1207, Honen's patron Kanezani suffers a dive in political fortunes. Uh, he falls from power. He's overthrown essentially by uh, another, by some political activities at the court. And Kanezani dies that year. Um, in, uh, at the same time that Kanezani's fortunes crash, <coughs> Honen gets into political trouble because two of his disciples uh, are accused of seducing women in the harem of the emperor. When the emperor is away, um, essentially they gave lectures on Nembutsu and Pure Land Buddhism uh, and the women were quote unquote converted. Uh, they're accused of not just converting them but of sleeping with them. And so they are then arrested, tried, found guilty and executed. Honen is therefore declared to be persona non grata by the court you can see his political fortunes have gone from being very, very high. He has great support to being, his fortunes are now very, very low. He has no support. Uh, and then he's ban banished from the capital. Okay. As soon as Honen leaves, as soon as Honen is thrown out of Kyoto, uh, those of his, many of his disciples, including Shinran, are also exiled at this time, as you know. Uh, but one of the impacts of that is that the people who are in the capital who have the Senchakshu decide we should print this, okay? We need, you know, we need uh, this text because we don't have Honen, okay, to refer to. It's something like the Buddha Sutras being written down in Sri Lanka when the Buddha is gone. So we have something to refer to. So, um, and excuse, and of course, that's what they do. Um, 
the sen chuck shu, uh, the, you know, money is collected. You know, again, printing is a very expensive thing to do. You have to carve blocks. Uh, paper is expensive, but they endeavor to do this. So sorry about the font here being, this is uh, PowerPoint changing the font. Um, so at this point, Honan celebrity has become enormous. Honan is mentioned or alluded to in many, many diaries and essays written at this time. People loved him or feared him. Um, and I have to mention here also that it, there was a Honan exhibition in the Kyoto National Museum in 2011 that I was fortunate enough to go to. And in that exhibition, there are a number of uh, works of art that are, that are associated with Honan and Honan's movement, including the, uh, the scroll of Ipen, uh, that is a national treasure that people really were uh, very impressed with. And I must say it was, it was gorgeous. There was also a statue and there were statues of Amida uh, carved by Kaike of the Unke and Kaike uh, famous um, Buddhist sculptures. Uh, the most famous Buddhist sculptors of the time, you know, they did the, the uh, uh, guardian images at the entrance of Todaiji and various other statues uh, throughout the region of Nara and Kyoto. But Kaike was a follower of Honen. Kaike had a kind of what's called an ago. He had an Amida name that he also used. And in one of the images of Amida that was supposedly carved by Honen's disciple Genchi, uh, they x-rayed it and found that there was a bunch of uh, a scroll in, uh, scrolls inside. They opened up the back of it and took out uh, what turned out to be a long list of names. And the names total almost 50,000 people who signed that uh, to show their devotion, their allegiance, their support, their reverence for Honan. So that's just an astonishing piece of history. That never happened to anyone else in Japanese history. So this is a really remarkable uh, display of the impact that Honen had. By when we get to 1211, the printing blocks are now finished for the Senchakshu. Uh, Honen is allowed to return to Kyoto, finally from exile. Uh, he actually, he's exiled to Shikoku, but he only goes to Osaka because he's sort of protected and hidden there. Uh, but after he gets back to Kyoto, he dies uh, only five months later. As soon as that's done, the printing is undertaken. The Senchakshu is made public, okay? Um, to print the work of a Japanese Buddhist author and release it to the public was to my knowledge at this time, the first time this ever happened in Japanese history. I may be wrong, I'd love to be corrected, but it's the first one that I know of. Uh, so this is a remarkable achievement. Uh, as soon as the Senchakshu was printed, of course, that means many, many people can get a copy of it. Uh, and then this, of course, creates even more anger. <laughs> So how can you say that Nembus is superior to other practices? What are you talking about, you know? So in 1227, uh, the Tendai is, uh, you know, establishment is so angry with Honen creating a kind of competing religious model to their own that they uh, send some sort of samurai monks out and they find the printing blocks and destroy them, as I mentioned earlier. And in 1239, what happens? They carve new blocks and they print it again, okay? This is also just remarkable that this happens. This would not happen if there was not enormous demand for this kind of thing. Um, and in, uh, when we get to the 1290s, so Honen dies in 1212. Uh, 1280s, 1290s, Honen's um, Japanese language, all of Honen's writings are collected uh, and edited and uh, put together in manuscript form. And the Japanese version of this, which is called the Wago Toruku, so the record of his writings in Wago in Japanese, uh, are then carved and printed. This is also completely unprecedented. As far as I know, this is the first printing of any Japanese language Buddhist book. This is, uh, this is called the Imperial Edition. So the folklore or the myth about this is that the Imperial Court at this point is so enamored of what Honen has created that they give their um, not only support for this, but they give their money for this, for this to be done. I don't know if that really happened. I find that story hard to believe, but who knows? Maybe it's true. Anyway, um, so I wanna just uh, mention something, a uh, little kind of theoretical uh, input here. Bear with me, I'm just gonna read this. In his outline of a theory of practice, the philosopher Pierre Bardou comments that in regulating ritual behavior, 
These people he calls the grammarians of decorum, decide what is and what is not right to say and to do. But they can never, quote, presume to encompass in a catalog of recurrent situations in appropriate conduct, what he calls the art of the necessary improvisation, which in fact is what defines excellence. In other words, the grammarians of decorum, of course, the people that represent the status quo in terms of what is appropriate behavior, what is appropriate language, but of course, they cannot anticipate all situations uh, that involve new and creative ideas. So why did Honen's doctrine cause so much of a stir if Nimbus had been so pervasive before him, as I've mentioned? What marks Honen's improvisation as excellent was the fact that he was a kind of rare individual who was both orthodox in remaining within pres the prescribed modes of speech and action that I just mentioned above, and yet he was also innovative in a way that can only be described as artistic. And personally, he was clearly charismatic as an individual. Honen is, only one, is one of only a handful of individuals in Japanese history and in Buddhist history who, I think we can say with confidence, led people to a new, under, a new path that will later be seen as a genuine paradigm shift. Okay, so what is this, when I say paradigm shift, that's an academic term for a kind of new model of how things work, right? It's sort of like Einstein's theory of relativity explains is it was a paradigm shift in terms of our understanding of physics uh, that took the same explanation that Newton had given before and then explained it in a different way, right? So Hoden has a new paradigm. So what are the new, what are the themes of the new paradigm? I'll just go through this quickly and then we can open this up for questions. Uh, number one, chosen practice, a hierarchy of practice. One form is gonna be what I call the orthodox practice, the shogyo. Other practices are fine, but they're only supportive. So this is a new thing, right? Um, this is not an exclusive nembutsu practice, but it's a prioritized nembutsu practice. And by that means that practice achieves a kind of special status. Uh, it is sacred, okay? This leads to a sense of reverence toward that single practice. So the name Senchakshu, this famous book, uh, literally translates as a collection of passages and why nimbutsu is the chosen practice. Uh, but it's not the chosen practice that we choose, it's chosen by the Buddha. So even though we also have to kind of choose it, it's been chosen for us, we just have to accept the authority of the Buddha's decision, right? Another new theme in this paradigm is that recitation itself is, is uh, especially sacred. So the sacred nature of the human voice is the thing that Honan really kind of elevated to a different level. Of course, there've been lots of recitation and ritual chanting in Buddhism before Honan. Uh, and in some sense, people are saying, well, this kind of looks esoteric, you know, because we have a lot of mantras and things in Buddhism prior to Honan. But Honan is saying that when you take the human voice and you connect it to, or you use it in service of this sacred practice, this chosen practice that is nembutsu, that achieves something quite different. And then the human voice itself becomes a kind of vehicle for the creation, the kind of ex expression of what is sacred. And what's wonderful about this is that anybody can do it. Anybody who can speak. Of course, you can have nembutsu even if you can't speak, but that's the, that's the implication here. So with Shandao as an example of authority, Honen asserted the traditional Buddhist goal of attaining samadhi was still very much relevant. That is this advanced state of meditation. But Honen is, uh, is pushing very hard for the idea that samadhi meditation, samadhi attainment is not only done through quiet mindfulness meditation, you know, with your eyes closed or staring at the ground, but in fact can be done through recitation nembutsu as well. And that's powerful because you can start off reciting nembutsu in which you're in a state of mind that is not focused, but in the process of reciting nembutsu, your mind becomes focused. That's a very key point to how this whole system works. Mappo. Another new theme is what I call forget mappo. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, for Honen, Mappa was already, was really kind of beside the point at this point. Why? Because this sacred model of recitation Nembusu is containing the essence of the Buddha that has been gifted to us, transcends any notion of time, transcends any notion of degradation uh, of, the, of the Dharma and the Sangha 
over time. Essentially what Honan is saying is if the Buddha is not with us, then we take something that represents him uh, in having a relationship with the Buddha and with the truth that the Buddha represents. And that is Nembutsu. And that has nothing to do with time. That has nothing to do with history. Okay. Another uh, new paradigm theme is democratization. Indian notions of practice are based on the yogic presumptions. The more difficult to practice, the greater the gain. The, even though the Buddha you know, uh, spoke repeatedly of the importance of having an attitude, which is called the middle path, you know, that avoids the extreme of too, too much asceticism and avoids the extreme of indulgence and materialism. At the same time, it's very clear within the Buddhist traditions that the more difficult the practice is, the, more, the greater the attainment. So in the Amida Hall, uh, Jogyo's Ammai Hall on Mount Hie, for example, you circumambulate the Buddha for 90 days. You're not allowed to sleep. So you have to sort of, you know, put your arms on these horizontal posts, you know, that you kind of lean on to rest. Of course, you fall asleep. But the idea that you're going to do practice for 90 days, right, shows again that it's a very, very physically difficult, physically and mentally demanding thing. This is based on that same presumption. The more difficult to practice, the greater the achievement. Honan is saying something entirely different. Honan is saying, in fact, the easier the practice, the greater the gain. And that's because there's a kind of theology behind this notion of easy, uh, simple, because, and that is accessibility. This is based on the faith that the compassion of the Buddhas is so powerful, they want us to succeed so strongly that they will assist us in our practice. And they are thereby invested in this kind of accessible means to the sacred, that is recitation, Nembutsu. Why? Because this is the practice that the greatest number of people can succeed in. Existential honesty. So uh, another part of this is uh, this accepting of our limitations. This goes back to what the Japanese call Niju Jinshin. And this is a doctrine of uh, Zendo Shandao, right? So the core, pro the core problem with many people uh, in terms of the religious thinking at his time, and Shandao was saying the same thing, is they have unrealistic expectations about what people can actually accomplish on the Buddhist path. You know, so the uh, Honan asked the question, have you seen any Buddhas lately? If you haven't, then maybe that's because people don't become Buddhas anymore, right? And so therefore you should think, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, you should think about Buddhism in a different way as maybe perhaps offering us something else. So um, that is sort of the five points that I think are quite new with Honan, quite powerful and very much, uh, you know, define what his religious teaching was. Um, so, apre ginku sama. So, what happens after Honen? What do we see in Japanese Buddhism? Well, we see Dogen, Shinran, Nichiren all preaching a very similar message of devotion uh, to a single practice, okay? All raising their particular practice to a level of being a sacred object, just like Honen did. Uh, we have this idea of being a Buddha in this very body that's very, very famous. In uh, original enlightenment theory, Hongaku and Shingon and Tendai, that loses its appeal very dramatically. Of course, the idea is still around. People still study it. People, you know, in the traditional forms of Buddhism don't disappear just because Honen appeared. Uh, we, people still preach this and practice this, but in fact, this loses its appeal. And this, why, this is why when we get further into the medieval period, into the Tokugawa period, you know, those forms of Buddhism uh, shrink markedly and Pure Land Buddhism grows markedly. Honen convinces the world that the Nimbutsu is a sacred object. As such, this led to its expression in the arts, okay? So we have all sorts of interesting artistic developments in Nimbutsu theater, Nimbutsu dance, Nimbutsu painting that had never done before. They were never conceived of. If they were done before, we didn't know about them. But after Honen, they become, they become prevalent and they become public and they are moved into the center, right, of the kind of Buddhist culture uh, in the urban environments. So here's an example. Here's Shinran Myogo Honzon, this is called. This is a painting of Shinran in which we see the Nembu, a form of the Nembutsu on an, a lotus flower. That is, a Nembutsu is on an altar. What is that? What goes on an altar? A Buddha goes on an altar, but here we have the Nembutsu on the altar, okay? So 
This is another form. This is not so clear. Let's look at this one. Uh, these are called myogo honzon also, and are komyo honzon, komyo referring to the light, okay? Notice the light rays coming off the phrases, the religious phrases that are all on lotus flower. So we have five lotus flowers here, on two of which are Buddhas. One is Amida, one is Shakyamuni, okay? And then we have, on the other three, we have different form formulas of Nabutsu. Uh, so this is an interesting example also of how uh, the, the Buddha mindfulness sacred recitation formulas achieve the same status as a Buddha image, right? And notice how the language icons on the lotuses are bigger than those of the Buddha. Also notice how Amida and Shakyamuni are almost identical. This is also something to keep in mind. This is from the Shinshu tradition. This is not Joroshu. Uh, this shows how um, the conception of this was in the medieval period. This is another one that's much brighter, okay. And this is a samurai helmet with a nimbutsu on top of it. Here's another one. So, that concludes my talk. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you for your patience. Dr. Blum, that was very, very informative for all of us. We'll have to have you continue on with the lecture sometime in the future. Well, let's close right now with Gosho. Namo Ami Dabutsu. Namo Ami Dabutsu. Namo Ami Dabutsu. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hopefully, you will join us next time. <laughs>